Okay, well, good evening, folks. Welcome to uh, the first of our uh, annual lecture series events, and uh, welcome to the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and Society. Uh, this is our new building, and uh, while we've been here for 35 years, we've been in We've been in an amazing number of rooms and <laughs> buildings all over the medical center, all over the medical school, all over the various campuses of UMass, uh, and we've landed here. And, uh, and, and we really hope that you'll begin to consider your home. We have lots of community events that you can find online and, uh, and lots of programs as well. So, um, I, I'm going to take a little time to introduce uh, my friend John Kapitzin. Uh, so mm, we met 33 years ago, and I was 32. <laughs> I was 37, and and uh, we hair our hair was black, <laughs> and uh, gravity hadn't taken its downward. <laughs> and we used to run at lunch pretty much every day, and and uh, and uh, we listened to each other's t guided meditation tapes as we were learning about it. MBSR, and uh, in the basement of UMass, yeah. We used to joke about it, but it was true. We would come in in the morning and not know if it had rained or snowed or sleeted or where there'd been a hurricane uh, because you couldn't see anything under there, but it was a fantastic place to be. Fantastic, because nobody bothered us. <laughs> <laughs> so we really got to do our work for a, a long time. And now I'm 65 and he's 70. And, and uh, I was thinking a lot about uh, Leonard Cohen, uh, and I know that Leonard Cohen is someone that John really loves his music. And it, uh, as I was thinking about tonight and writing this little piece, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might not sing it, but I'll recite it. Now, there's these. There's a long st a song by Leonard called "The Tower of Song," and the first lines go like this, and they're really apropos that. Uh, well, my friends are dead and my hair is gray, and I ache in the places that I used to play. You know that feeling? Maybe if you're 25, you don't, or 30. Uh, and I've really been struck by what a remarkable gift uh, we've been given. And it all started with John's vision. I mean, I've worked here most of my academic professional career. And uh, it's an enormous privilege to work across a field in the arc of your career and see it move like this. And, and uh, I, I was reflecting on it, thinking, well, yeah, we're in this building, and it's true. I'm, uh, I've been sort of the, I've been the director of the center for 15 years now. But um, this garden is one of those gardens that's been long in the planting. You could say thousands of years in the planting, but if we're talking about this garden, it's at least three and a half decades in the planting, and it started with John. And I was really reflecting on, look what's happened to this garden that was entrusted to you and how much it's flourished and blossomed and borne fruit that are, is now all over the world. And how much gratitude I and I know our colleagues have for you. And we have so much to celebrate, so much to rejoice about. And only one way, we can do it in a lot of ways, one of the ways was to make sure you were the first speaker in this in this speaker series in this new 
incarnation of the center here in this building. And there's one more thing, if you, if you know the song, it goes on and the next lines are, uh, and I'm crazy for love, but I'm not coming on. I'm just paying my rent every day in the tower of song. I'm crazy for love and I'm not coming on. You know that, how hard that is? To be crazy for love, but not come on. And you could say in a very real way that what has been wrought here is the result of being crazy for love. Being crazy for love. So without any more ado, I want to introduce you all to my dear friend, longtime colleague and brother and Dharma friend, John Kabat-Zinn. Okay. Wow, so it's incredible to be here in this amazing space and, and with, all, with all of you. Uh, I see old familiar faces from a long time ago and new faces. And, um, this is the beginning of uh, an extended celebration of the 35 years I got <laughs> You're in the same place you were last month. Uh, this is an extended celebration uh, over a number of days, and not just celebration, but a deep dive into the work uh, that um, takes place here, uh, and a kind of inquiry in some sense uh, as to what it all means and how it can be furthered in the world. So what I thought I would do this evening is in some sense, um, Saki pointed out that I'm 70 years old and I started the stress reduction clinic when I was 35. So that's half, exactly half of my life. There's something very satisfying about that. Like I, I get it. It's half of my life. Uh, and it's really interesting and I'm sure you all have the same experience that life unfolds and who you were and who you are, you're obviously the same person in the same body, only not for the person and not for the body. Uh, it's an, a kind of uh, an evolutionary arc, so to speak. And, um, and I love the way Saki framed it as a love affair. I really feel that uh, this is a labor of love. When I sort of was asking myself, years ago, after I did all the things that I did and got all the training that I got, knowing that that was not what I wanted to be doing with my life, but I didn't know what I wanted to be doing with my life, I asked myself the question for many, many years, what would I love so much I'd pay to do it? So just flip, like a job, you know, I'm looking for a job because I need money. What about looking for a job where I would love this work so much, I'd actually get down on my hands and knees and beg somebody to let me do it. And somehow or other, for you know, reasons that are so improbable and impossible to describe, I got a chance to do it here. Um, and just from the point of view of full disclosure, you know, because we like to sort of say we have no uh, kind of uh, conflict of interest and that kind of thing, we're always signing things like that. Um, I am completely conflicted. I mean, because this was like a labor of love. I mean, I wanted so much to do this work, and yet I had no credentials whatsoever for doing any of it. I mean, I'm a molecular biologist, for God's sake. <laughs> so how do you get to set up a clinic and work with patients and everything? And the answer is, I have no idea. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, there's no way to explain it. But it did happen. And, uh, and my hope at the time that it, you know, started was that, and, and really sort of a deep conviction that if we could show that this was valuable in a place like University of Massachusetts Medical Center for all the various reasons that I thought it might be, uh, then 
the model would spread. It would be uh, what they call a proof of concept and it would spread around the world and, and, and it has. And, and being trained as a molecular biologist at MIT and so forth, uh, I realized that I had no competencies on the research side in terms of working with human beings. I worked with bacteria and bacterial viruses. That was my training. Um, so in terms of the research piece, it, it was mostly just how to hang in long enough to generate enough interest so really well-trained scientists would be able to do it. And that's happened too. A lot of it I can hardly understand. I mean, you know, it's like heavy-duty neuroscience. Uh, and the beautiful clinical medicine, we saw an example of it today in medical grand rounds. I mean, this is Ron Epstein from the University of uh, Rochester, uh, which has a long lineage of humanistic medicine and the art, if you will, of medicine, going back to George Engel and all of George Engel's students. And here was Ron Epstein giving grand rounds uh, called Mindful Practice, Mindful Medical Practice. He had written an article in JAMA in 1999 called Mindful Practice, and that, that was kind of another initiative. So the first thing I want to say before I get down to my talk, this is just in response to Saki's inter beautiful introduction. Um, first thing I want to say is that the beauty of this work is that there's nothing special about it, and it is insanely special. And there's nothing special about me, or Saki, or any of the other people who work here, or you, unless we're all equally that special. And my view is that we are. And often we forget it because we're under so much stress, and then we kind of... Have you noticed under stress you tend to contract a little bit? not just emotionally, but cognitively, and never mind somatically. And, 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 and so the message here is really a universal one and very, very profound, and it goes beyond what we usually think of as health and well-being. Okay? Health and well-being were words that, you know, we, and then Ron commented that it's better to use the word resilience when you're talking about you know, to doctors at least, that, you know, nobody's interested in health and well-being. <laughs> <laughs> now it's resilience. In five years, it'll be some other sexy thing. But w what is real health? And, you know, I mean, I was at NIH 10 years ago for uh, a day-long symposium on mindfulness in medicine, which the very fact that the NIH held a day-long symposium out of the, the uh, president's office uh, on mindfulness in medicine and health was so improbable from the point of view of 1979 when I started this, you know, stress reduction clinic. And here's NIH now, now, 10 years after that day-long conference, funding mindfulness research to the tune of millions of dollars a year. And it's like, how did that happen? And somebody there got up in a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck at the end of this day long, various presentations, and he said, you know, on the basis of what I've he heard here today, uh, this is somebody who worked at the NIH, uh, I think we should rename the NIH the National Institutes of Disease and, uh, or live up to the name, the National Institutes of Health. Now, of course, you know, there's a certain amount of hyperbole in something like that and exaggeration. Now, like, you know, we've got all Ebola cases happening in the United States all of a sudden. So we need, like, to understand a lot and be very, very mindful of how we actually encounter the things that we're facing and the Center for Disease Control and um, the NIH, you know, this is like really, really important work. But in the larger scheme of well-being or health rather than merely disease or disease, this, we're still in our infancy. We still don't really understand what a life of like profound 
well-being would look like. And again, this, this morning, um, Ron used the word eudaimonia, you know, this sort of ancient Greek word that really has to do with thriving. It has to do with, you know, beyond well-being, so to speak, because everything, like, after a certain point, it loses its meaning, and then you have to find a more hyperbolic word for it, you know. But so eudaimonia, a sense of, like, complete balance in the face of the full catastrophe of the human condition. And because the full catastrophe of the human condition is not going to change anytime soon. I mean, we're born, we die, and in between sickness, old age, and death, you know, you could get very pessimistic about it, but there's also just as much joy and opportunity and beauty. And yet a lot of the time, if we get caught up one way or another, we, we lose touch with that, and we don't feel balanced or equanimous or open-hearted. Uh, a lot of the time we feel contracted because things aren't the way we want them to be. And so I thought this evening that what might be most fun, in a way, is to uh, really explore in some sense um, what the meditation practice is all about uh, from a kind of a new beginning. Um, or just another angle, or just the same angle. Uh, but I'll just uh, sort of share with you some of, you know, sort of, so, so my kind of way of understanding it now, because while we've reached this particular point in the evolution of mindfulness-based interventions, as sometimes called, MBIs, uh, I don't know if you've realized this, but it's getting awfully popular. It's on, you know, Time magazine, and, you know, there'll be something coming out in uh, 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper sooner or later. It's supposed to be sometime in the next month, but that depends on the news cycles, because, you know, mindfulness is not great news. It's really great news. So, you know, <laughs> really great news has to take a back seat to the pressing matters of the day, and, and, and understandably so. But with all this uh, excitement about mindfulness, you know, that, that could potentially be the kiss of death for what we really have been doing for the past 35 years. Or at least something where we're going to have to take a certain kind of responsibility for the essence of this, or it, like everything else, in this world gets commodified, dumbed down, exported, uh, you know, uh, turned into a concept, uh, overdone in the media, and then five years later, no one cares about it anymore. If this is really about the transformation and the healing of humanity, which I believe it is, and I felt that way from the very beginning, then this proof of concept, this test case of UMass, we now know that that is more the case probably than less. And so what is our responsibility? Not mine, not Saki's, not even the Center for Mindfulness, but every single one of us and every single other person on the planet who's either been touched by this already who, or who simply is crazy for love and is not losing their mind, coming on in that way, but is paying my rent every day in the Tower of Song. You know, that phrase, I mean, he, Leonard Cohen is such a genius. I'm paying my rent every day in the Tower of Song. And then there's a doo-wop behind that. Uh, paying my rent every day in the Tower of Song. What's that mean? What does that mean? What if the Tower of Song, and I'm just at living here, and I haven't even thought about this, but what if, what if the Tower of Song was the beauty of being alive? What would paying my rent every day mean? Maybe it would mean not missing the beauty, not being so overwhelmed by the urgent and the information overlaid and the endless communicating that we lose touch with the Tower of Song, the 
and, and, and the Tower of Song, you could think, I mean, again, just right off the top of my head, it's like, there's a line from, uh, uh, from Rilke that goes, much stands behind me, I stand before it like a tree. Well, what stands behind us is everybody that came before, all of human history, and even in our genes way back beyond before history, in the Paleolithic and before that. We are, in some sense, these evolved beings in this towering uh, lineage of human genomes figuring out what the most uh, sort of adventitious circumstances, situations are of the day. And now we're learning that our genomes, even inside of us, they're not like some static, you know, genetic fate that was sealed for you when you were born. Because this new science of epigenetics is understanding that the chromosomes are completely dynamic and what you eat and how much you uh, uh, exercise and whether you have intimate relationships that are profoundly satisfying, to say nothing of meditating or other kinds of things, uh, actually upregulate and downregulate your genes by the thousands. By the thousands. So that means that if you actually align yourself with, I'll use the word beauty, but whatever it is that is deepest and best in us as human beings, your chromosomes down in every tiny little cell of your body that has chromosomes, not the red blood cells, but everything else pretty much, is listening and it is changing its biology on the basis of your cultivation of intimacy with your own mind and mine with my mind, okay? So this is like, I can't be intimate with your mind in the same way that you can, or with your body. But if we forget that, and we're looking outside for all these things that will get us through life uh, without attending to what's already ours, then you're not paying your rent in the Tower Song. And you're going to get evicted. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's wild, isn't it? I mean, it really means that we have a responsibility to appreciate the gift of this moment. Because when it comes right down to it, this is all, all we have. It's all we have. And yet, if you start to pay attention to your mind and what's on your mind, which is one of the major lenses that mindfulness brings to the adventure, the first thing you notice is that most of the time, your mind is off someplace else. And, the, you know, two favorite places are the future and the past. And in terms of the future, it's, all, it's like either planning does this sound familiar to anybody? You know? <laughs> planning, planning, planning. And when you're not planning, worrying. Planning for how it's all going to go wrong and, you know, and then what's going to happen. And then the other part of it is like, you check it out. I mean, don't take my word for it. How many of you would say that on a, on, on a regular basis, I won't say every day, but more or less that meditation is a, in some form or other, formal meditation practice is part of your life. Anybody? Or are you all just... Okay, so, I mean, this is the center for mindfulness, so I wonder, like, you know, why would people come out on a perfectly miserable, rainy uh, Thursday night to hear a talk on meditation if they didn't care about it? To catch my profile? I don't think so. No, I mean, and this is really the sort of... People all around the world consider this place to be Mecca. I want you to know that. By the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And that's only going to get worse. <laughs> so it really, you know, calls us to ask, what is my responsibility? Each one of us, not just Saki or other, whoever else works here or me or anybody else. What is our collective and individual responsibility to ourselves and to the world. And to me, that's like the foundational in terms of health, in terms of really pouring energy into what's right with us, as we often say to our patients, rather than just attending to what's wrong. 
It's not that we forget about what's wrong, but there's always, as long as you're breathing, and we, you know, I've been saying this forever, as long as you're breathing, from our point of view, there's more right with you than wrong with you, no matter what's wrong with you. And people go, whoa. Imagine coming to the hospital and getting a message like that, and it's like, no wonder they call it the UMass Tower of Song. I mean, that's a very, very w wonderful way to be encountered, you know, since everybody gets an encounter form when they come to the hospital. So it's all electronic now, I know. But, but still, uh, the important thing is not the electronic encounter, it's the encounter. Okay, and so that means one human meeting another. And as Ron so elegantly spoke about today, how can you meet the other if you're not present, if you're lost in thought, if you're thinking about the last patient or lunch or whatever it is? And then if you start to watch your mind, as you know, because you practice this, the more you cultivate intimacy with your mind, the more you see what's up. And what's up is that the mind is like completely out of control most of the time. <laughs> what? You're in there too? My God. Pol Pot, Adolf Hitler, the, the, the works, you know. I mean, it's like sometimes, you know, and, and so it's, re that, and that's not bad. You see, this is where the non-judgmental thing comes in, mindfulness is the awareness that arises. So just to say, okay, nowadays I try to emphasize so that it, it's just totally clear that, and I like to say it this way, to a first approximation, mindfulness and awareness are exactly the same thing, pure awareness, okay? Uh, now, in science, there are sort of methods of successive approximation. So what we can take in now, in 2014, is very different from what the world could hear in 1979, believe me. I mean, it required something else to get through to the mainstream then about something as weird and lunatic fringe and crystal gazing, new age nonsense as meditation. Okay, now we're in different territory, but that doesn't mean that all of that stuff can't very easily accrete back to it and be completely dismissed as you know, idiotic or, you know, sort of whatever. And so this means that um, in some sense, it's the outer reflection of the fact that if you practice, you discover that it's, it's infinite. It's like successive approximation there too, like that it's not like, okay, I've done 40 years of meditation practice, I've arrived, I'm here. I'm enlightened, or whatever the end of this is. What is the, what is the goal of all of this anyway? And if you do wind up having that kind of feeling that you're enlightened uh, or that the mind is saying that to yourself like hmm, well I wouldn't say it of course but when it comes right down to it you know <laughs> I'm really getting there I've like really grown a lot in the past 40 years the problem isn't with the word enlightenment at that point the problem is with the personal pronoun and the need to identify it that way okay so all I want to convey, and for the rest of this talk, if nothing else, is that mindfulness is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the deepest things about being human that is available to us in human culture. I mean, it's, it's just endlessly deep. And so it's at least a lifetime's engagement and if we engage in it in a way that really understands the non-dual element of this, that mindfulness is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment. And notice it never says to what? Paying attention on purpose in the present moment and the kicker, non-judgmentally. Okay? Now, people argue with this definition or they have other definitions or whatever, but I did, never meant it to be like, now we'll seal this in some vacuum-proof uh, you know, uh, 
frame and we'll genuflect to that. No, it's, a, it's, it's an operational definition. It's just to try to get things going, so to speak. Like, okay, mindfulness is awareness and we can cultivate it like a muscle. We can exercise it. How do we do that? We, we pay attention on purpose in the present moment when else are you going to pay attention? And intentionally, on purpose means intentionally. So you have to, like, do some work to do it. And it's only the hardest work in the world, this is. And then non-judgmentally. And when you start to look at that, as you know, you see that we've got ideas and opinions about everything. We're continually judging, evaluating, liking, disliking, wanting, rejecting. And so the, the kind of those qualities that we started talking about of like a fully healthy, eudaimonious human being, well, they're not plagued by constantly, you know, being distracted and then aversive or grasping because those are emotionally unbalanced. And we're talking about balance. We're talking about equanimity. We're talking about well-being. I mean, you know, endless words for it. We're talking about being so comfortable in our own skin that nothing else needs to happen. And the practice is paying the rent. But then there's a way that we can misunderstand that. And that is that we think, oh, it's just like everything else, playing the violin or riding a bicycle or, or whatever. And... Uh, so the more we practice, the better we get. And that's true, and that's called the sort of instrumental learning. But this is where mindfulness is different from everything else, probably, that you've ever encountered in your life. And that is that there's an equal non-instrumental piece to it. And if you don't inhabit the non-instrumental piece, you can practice, practice, practice till you're blue in the face, but you're missing the essence, okay? And that is paradoxically and very difficult for us as Western go-getters to understand that there's no place to go. There's nothing to do. And there's no special something at the end of the rainbow to attain, okay? The special something is here, now. And it's insanely beautiful So then, the non-instrumental part, coupled with the instrumental part, it's like, and, and I sometimes use the example of, with non-instrumental, instrumental, it's like the wave particle nature of elementary particles, like electrons, okay? When you look at it a certain way, it's, it behaves like a wave. And the physicists, like every property it has is wave-like, non-local. Another way, do other experiments, particle-like, localized. And this, it's not one and it's not the other. So can we actually resonate with that around meditation practice? Yes, we do need to practice. And yet we have to be very, very careful how we practice. What kind of attitude we bring to it. Can we bring an attitude of non-striving, of non-doing, this is beginning to sound very anti-American. Non-striving, non-doing, what's he talking about? Okay. So that's the preamble to my talk. Uh, <laughs> I thought, well, the first thing I guess I want to do in the talk, I don't have a clicker, do I? So I have to go up there. Okay. I want to dedicate this talk to four people. Uh, just, just out of love, no other reason. Uh, and the first one is Jim Dallin. How many of you knew Jim? Ah, man, we're getting so old, you know, nobody. <laughs> uh, okay, so four or five people. So Jim was the chief of medicine uh, in 1979 when, when I started, and even before Judy came to UMass, and, uh, and he was just an extraordinary being. He was, he was simply extraordinary. Chief of medicine. 
And I won't say much about it except that his whole life changed in some way by beginning to just allow this kind of thing to happen in his department. You know? Because he could have killed it in a second. And he had every reason to. And some people suggested that he do it, you know, uh, like, uh, because I was a huge liability. And he didn't see it that way. And he befriended me. And he was a kind of true leader in the sense that he empowered others to find their way, not to do something so that he would look good. I mean, that's like, in some sense, the kind of one of the qualities of a true leader. He just like, he said, do this, but I want you to do research on it, which of course I would have done anyway, because like I'm a research scientist and I knew that we could have had the greatest thing here at UMass, and if it was just anecdotal, believe me, we would not be sitting here tonight. The reason we're sitting here tonight is the scientific papers that came out of the stress reduction clinic and that are continuing to do, and that are, again, by successive approximation, getting more and more rigorous. Because it's hard to do rigorous science when you don't have any money at all. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim is uh, one person that I really want to dedicate this talk to because without Jim Dallin, there would have never been a stress reduction clinic. It would have been gone very, very quickly or never started. And now he lives in Arizona and he's the head of the Andrew Weil Foundation. You know, Dr. Andrew Weil was like one of the most... Uh, so he's kind of like gone through a kind of what you could call an or orthogonal shift in consciousness because that's a long, long way. The other person is Brownie Wheeler, who is the chief of surgery here uh, for the entire time I was here. And, and, uh, and I wrote a piece in my book, Coming to Our Senses, about how I met Brownie. I was last night at a talk he gave in the faculty conference room. Uh, he now has Parkinson's, and it's not so easy to understand him, but he had all four or five surgeons up there reading a book that he's just written. Uh, but Brownie, when he was in his prime, which you can see here, um, he was, again, well, he and Jim Dallin were the most powerful people in the place. And the way I met him was in the room that he, we had this thing yesterday, the faculty conference room, that's where I was holding my classes in the first cycles of the stress reduction clinic. So in the winter of 1980, in the middle of a body scan, how many of you know what a body scan meditation is? Mm, great. Okay, so if you... I shouldn't have asked, you know, I know where we are. You know, it's like if, if, if a lot of hands didn't go up here, uh, we'd be in trouble. So anyway, I'm leading a body scan on these brand new beautiful yoga mats in lots of different colors and everybody's like dressed like they're going camping in the wilderness um, and, and I'm in black karate pants, barefoot and a black t-shirt and I'm halfway through, we're up to here in the body scan, I'm lying on the floor and the door of the faculty conference room opens and this very tall man in a white coat comes in followed by 30 people in white coats and suits and he walks right up to me, I'm lying there on the floor, and he walks right up and looks down and he says, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, I say, well, this is the new, the hospital's new stress reduction clinic. And he said, well, we have this room reserved for this super powerful <laughs> meeting of the, you know, surgeons with the surgical com community surgeons and so forth. At that point, I stood up. I came up to about his shoulder, and, uh, and he looks at me. I mean, you know, barefoot, karate pants, black T-shirt, and then he looks around at all these people, and this was like a big meeting. I found out later, it's a very, there was a lot hanging on this meeting. He had every reason to think he had the room, and he had all the power he needed to seize the room. I mean, to just take it especially given what it looked like was going on, you know. 
It could have been crystal gazing for all he knew. You know, it's like, what are these people doing? You know, so, uh, and he looked around and he asked one question, one question only. He looked around at all these people, you know, and he, and, he, and he said, he asked me, are these our patients? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then we'll take our meeting someplace else. And they paraded right out the door. That was in the faculty conference room. I can hardly tell the story without crying. And I wrote a, a chapter in my book, Coming to Our Senses, called Witnessing Hippocratic Integrity, where I described the whole thing. And, and the last sentence is something like, because I had just started the clinic. It was like the second, it was cycle one, because cycle, the first cycle, I don't remember what cycle you were in, Connie. I think it might have been... Yeah, so was it winter or spring? You were on the floor then. Uh, <laughs> I called the first cycle zero because I, you know, it was like, it was very experimental. Uh, so that was cycle one. And um, I, I, I said, this is how I ended the chapter, I knew I was going to really have a wonderful time at UMass. I mean, to have that kind of quality of heart and, and mind. And then we became good friends and, and over the years. And, you know, again, a lot of sort of things that you'd think would be like barriers just dissolve in integrity, when you live with integrity. And there's no one right way to do it. It's not like, oh, we just come to the CFM and take the stress reduction program and you'll get the curriculum on integrity. No, the, the curriculum on, on integrity lies in your own heart and your own discernment and your own willingness to be honest. And again, you, you know, maybe that's by successive approximation too. You grow into it. Witnessing Hippocratic Integrity. So. Is there an ethical foundation to the work that we do? You bet there is. And in the hospital, that ethical foundation is the Hippocratic Oath. It's an oath. And the, how does the oath go? I mean, doesn't it say first do no harm? Primum non necessary? How would you even know if you were doing harm if you weren't aware? If you weren't mindful, you have to be aware of the ways that you might not be aware of the effects you're having on another person or your thought patterns. Everything that Ron was talking about in his talk that you get fixated on a particular idea and you close off other alternatives and you come to premature judgment. And then you generate medical errors. This is not like, you know, dime store relaxation to make people feel better. This is like the critical element of care and caring. And it has to do with being present and having all your faculties available, including the sort of capacity to discern what's really going on, even in your own head, so that you don't, like, take a right turn when you need to go straight. And not even know that you've done it, and then get lost in some way that causes harm. So, there's a profound ethical dimension to this work. Uh, a lot of the time we don't make it explicit, it's implicit because it's under the umbrella of the Hippocratic Oath. But there is a very, very deep history associated with mindfulness. It's not like we made it up in the basement of, you know, on A-level uh, at UMass, uh, you know, 35 years ago. This is like, you know, a tradition that goes back thousands of years, and it's a very venerable tradition, and it sometimes can be looked at like it's Buddhist or religious, but it's actually not. It's more like a discovery that was made back in the day, 2,600 years ago, about the nature of the mind and the nature of suffering. And the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist anyway. Hmm? That's all like a particular kind of cultural framework and Overlay, a very beautiful one, by the way. I'm not, I'm not in any way uh, 
disregarding it or dishonoring it. It's, but if he discovered something akin to the law of gravity, something to do with suffering and the nature of suffering and the potential for freedom from suffering, especially the kind of suffering that we generate or compound for ourselves, then, you know, to say, to keep it just among the Buddhists, that would be obscene. Even the Buddhists don't think that's a good thing. And so, actually, it turns out that a huge number of people in the Buddhist tradition look to you mass. And I'm talking about Zen masters. I'm talking about monastics, monks and nuns from Korea, from Taiwan, from mainland China, from, you know, all over the place, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, look to this place, and they recognize it. They said, this is fantastic. Why? Because it's serving people who are suffering. Okay. So, these two people really created a, a climate in this medical center that had a lot of ramifications and repercussions. The next person that I want to dedicate this talk to is this man. I looked, I have a lot of pictures of sake. When I really get into my uh, iPhoto, I got tons of pictures of sake. I mean, we've been leading retreats forever together, and I really love this one, sake. I, uh, there's something about it that just holds the multiple dimensions of this man's heart. And, you know, as you heard, we've known each other for 33 years now. And, uh, you know, Saki's commitment to this way of being is huge. And it antedated his coming to the, stress, the nascent stress reduction clinic. He is a deep, deep student and lover of wisdom and compassion and uh, joyfulness and how that manifests in the formless as well as the f in the world of form. So we would not be sitting in this building if it weren't for Saki. I mean, he has been a remarkable leader through thick and thin. I'm not sure which is the worst, the thick or the thin, but in both sides of it, like pretty intense and pretty awful, and he actually wrote a paper that was published about that called Enjoy Your Death, because this whole thing was like on the chopping block about to die, and did in fact, and then was in some sense resurrected. That's all due to Saki. So again, this, this is a point. This is not in praise of Saki or Jim Dallin, or it's saying, look, let's get some kind of understanding here that all of us, in some sense, have the capacity to contribute, to put our shoulder to the wheel, to in some sense or other do our piece, do our work. And that whole business about, like, what would I love so much I'd pay to do it? Well, that's your job. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't mean that UMass doesn't cut your paycheck, but UMass would really like it if you gave 100% of yourself, showed up 100% at work with all of your creativity, all of your faculties. And that would transform the institution. That's what we need in all institutions, corporate you know, and otherwise. We need to create a kind of distributive community of responsibility and creativity and ultimately an understanding of what, what business we're in. And then to do it 100%. Maybe you heard on NPR today and in the New York Times yesterday or the day before about this judge in, in, in uh, Texas who went to Duncan's, the, the man who died of Ebola, he went to his home and spoke with his fiance with no protective gear or anything, and he's the head of Homeland Security in that county and emergency management and so forth. Um, he went with no protective anything, and he transferred them in a car to another location. And when he was confronted 
by his wife who was enraged with this because they have small kids and like, you know, and then also, you know, other people saying, you know, this might have been hugely unwise, but he had checked it out with, you know, everything about the medical principles associated with when people are infectious and when they're not with Ebola. He said, listen, we are completely committed to stopping the Ebola epidemic right here in Dallas, right now. Okay? But there are two ways we could do it. We could do it as a poli- we could go into police state mode, or we can do it with compassion and kindness. And I'm choosing to do it with compassion and kindness. I want them to be treated the way I would want my children or my spouse to be treated. And so, you know, this is like, it's, it's in the present moment. I mean, it's like, we see this a lot of the time. And time will tell, you know, we're all on a very, very rapid learning curve, you know, associated with. But let's not kid ourselves. I mean, remember in... 1918, there was an influenza epidemic because influenza is spread, you know, in the air. And I don't know what fraction of the human people, population on the planet died, but it was considerable. You know, we need to stop Ebola because, you know, these things mutate and they mate with other viruses. And, you know, the one thing you would not want to think about is that it could actually become a respiratory illness. Okay? This requires huge mindfulness on the part of the CDC, on the part of hospitals, on the part of everybody to sort of take responsibility for this, but to do it out of clarity rather than out of fear. Because once you go the fear route, you lose your mind. You know, and we say that in language, you know, I saw red, I, I, I lost my mind, you know, what, when we feel threatened to a certain extent. And just to say, parenthetically, that, you know, studies on the neuroscience of MBSR have recently shown on our patients here that, um, that, the, that threat reactivity center in the brain called the amygdala, it gets thicker with stress, chronic stress. And it gets thinner with eight weeks of mindfulness. The, the gray matter density is lower by eight weeks of mindfulness. Meanwhile, other regions of interest, so-called in the, in the brain, that are involved in all sorts of important functions like emotion regulation and perspective taking and uh, executive function and so forth, uh, learning and memory in particular with the hippocampus and other areas of the limbic system actually and the cortex actually um, um, get thicker. So this is like one example of not, that it's not just our genes that are paying attention with their ear to the rail, but actually our, uh, our brain is continually reshaping itself based on experience, and meditation may be really profound in that way. So, and this is the fourth person that I want to dedicate this talk to, Florence Melio Meyer, who has made so many different contributions to, th- to uh, the work of the Center for Mindfulness over so long. I mean, it's almost impossible to enumerate. But sh- she now, like, flies all over the world with her colleagues, training people in more and more countries in this kind of thing. Why? Because it's very easy to misunderstand what this stuff is about. And without really good training, we're going to sort of, it will be degraded. And so just a, a deep bow to Florence. I don't know if she's here. There. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and, and again, I mean, how long have you been here? I mean, what year did you come? 94. 94, 1994. So, longevity in the stress reduction clinic tends to be that way, you know. Because, again, why? Because we're paying the, our rent in the Tower of Song, and it's all love. Okay? Now, Blaise Pascal said, so if I close this, will that just shut off? Blaise, ca- that's all the slides I'm showing tonight, folks. It's like amazing. Usually I know people think I have a disease because I show far too many slides. But uh, Blaise Pascal is famous for having said, uh, all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. 
Does anybody here know who Blaise Pascal was even? You know, he's a famous French philosopher and mathematician of the 17th century. And he was what's called the genius of the second order. Uh, a genius of the first order is somebody who, like, if you were just smarter, you'd be like them. A genius of the second order is, forget about it. <laughs> All of man and th the women in the room, maybe this is one time in which you don't want to go for gender equality. All of man's difficulties stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. You know. So we punish people by doing that instead of teaching them how. And teachers, when, you know, more and more, I don't know if you're aware of this, but one of the beauties of the, the repercussions of the work of the Center for Mindfulness over all these years is that it's moving into education, and not just higher education, it's moving into higher education big time. It's funny how we like to pat ourselves on the back and you know, talk about us as higher education. Uh, but so in lower education, you know, it's coming up through the floorboards. Seriously, it's coming up through the floorboards because the teachers are pulling their hair out. They don't know what to do. And they're beginning to actually recognize that if they want the kids to learn, maybe they need to teach them how to tune their instruments of learning before they play. Just like an orchestra, they don't say, well, I'm the greatest musician, I got a Stradivarius, and I'm a member of the New York Philharmonic. I don't need to tune. Of course they tune. So what is meditation? It's like tuning. Medicine, according to sort of the deep Indo-European root of the word medicine and meditation, is med the Latin is medere, which means to cure, but the deep Indo-European root means to measure. Many of you know this, of course. So what is medicine? It's the restoring of, and it's not measure the way like we can just take a ruler and measure the length of the stage. That's an external standard. This is every, more platonic. Everything has its own right inward measure. So uh, in a multi-dimensional dynamical system like a human being's health, it's not like, yes, I've got my health and I'm going to hang on to it. Health is a dynamical process. It's not a thing. You put it in the bank and hold on to it. It's, it's lifestyle related. It's moment to moment. What I, what I would like to do with you is actually practice for a little while. Would you be up for that? And then use that in a way, it won't be totally silent because I'd like to use it as a way to kind of inform some of these uh, points that I've been trying to visit or, or point out uh, today. So let's just, uh, and I'm going to actually do it on the cushion uh, just to kind of, not that you have to practice on a cushion uh, at all, uh, but there is these formal meditation practices are really important. We all understand that the real meditation practice is, I hope we all understand that the real meditation practice is how you live your life. Okay? There's no point in doing any kind of exercise if it doesn't translate into real life. But the paying the rent in the Tower of Song has these two elements to it. That is the formal meditation practice and the informal. And then remember what I said about instrumental and non-instrumental. So the non-instrumental, you could sort of distort that to say, well, I don't really need to sit, you know, because it's like, there's no place to go, nothing to do, nothing to, it, no special state to attain, so to hell with it. I'll just be mindful. <laughs> it, 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 would it were that easy? This is the hardest work in the world for us, folks. And the fact that so many hundreds of thousands and millions of people are doing it now is really testimony to the, the, the wisdom of human beings. The original idea for MBSR was that it would be probably really good if Americans meditated and did yoga. All of us who wanted to because it would be so conducive of wisdom, well-being, greater self-compassion, so forth. So, okay, then you get, you know, at a certain point to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to meditate now, which is always, a, it's just a thought, by the way, but it's a useful one because it'll get you on the cushion or on the chair or uh, lying down doing a body scan. It doesn't really matter, but so you settle in 
And I invite you to just settle in. And then see if you can just be aware. Just be aware of whatever is salient, whatever is here in this moment. And see if you can feel the wakefulness, the, the non-conceptual knowing that awareness already is. So you, you don't have to do anything, you're just sitting here and knowing it. I'm not even telling you to sit up straight or to focus on anything. And since the present moment has these interesting properties of it's always now, and yet this moment of now is rapidly gone, can you actually stay in the emerging moment of now with whatever is most vivid in your experience? And you might think of this uh, setup as a kind of laboratory. You've got your own laboratory for investigating the Tower of Song. For investigating who's meditating, if you think you're meditating. We're simply apprehending what is arising and passing away in this open, spacious, cognizant, knowing field we call uh, awareness. And an essential element of our humanity that's already available to us, so we don't need to develop it. It's here. It's online, on board. Can we rest in awareness itself, just even for the briefest of moments? And now this briefest of moments. 
without any agenda, without having to have a special feeling or anything. Just as an experiment. Whether you've never meditated before or whether you've been meditating forever. And now if, if there's any way in which you have some kind of thought or framework in the mind that you're meditating, see if you can just simply let that dissolve and continue being present. So you're not going anywhere, you're not trying to do anything, you're not looking for anything. You're simply resting in wakefulness. How is it? And I don't mean, oh, start thinking about how it is. I mean, apprehend directly how it feels. What is, what is known, what is felt, what is heard, what is seen, what is tasted, what is touched. And noticing how easy it is to fall into thought. To tell yourself how to do it when there's no doing involved. How easy it is to fall into commentary or liking, or disliking, or impatience, or into not being comfortable in this moment and wanting something else to happen. And can your awareness, again, experimenting, can your awareness hold that without having to make it good or bad? If impatience arises, then you know, you're asking yourself, who's impatient? I mean, you came for a talk. If it, if it weren't this, it'd be me blabbing about something else. But, you know, it's all this moment. So. Can we befriend this moment just exactly the way it is? And again, it's an experiment. It's not a catechism. Can we inhabit it? And, and what role does the body play? Where's the body in all of this? In this 
vast field of awareness. What role does self-criticism play or emotions of one kind or another? or boredom, or any other mind state. And can we hold the whole play of whatever's unfolding moment by moment in awareness without needing to describe it or judge it or pursue it or reject it. Just this, sitting here. Feeling what you're feeling. Now let's just play with transitioning from this moment to this moment. Where you're listening to a talk How's that different from being awake? If you're really attending to what's being said or attending to your own interior experience, can you see that it might be a seamless whole? It's life. Expressing itself in the only moment we ever have And the more ways we have of inhabiting the present moment and the more comfortable we can be with whatever arises within it, which sometimes is unpleasant, discomforting, aversive, confusing, painful, sometimes neutral, and sometimes seductive, enticing, pleasant, sometimes completely thought-bound, and sometimes just not bound at all. Just awake. No agenda. No place to go. Nothing to do. already in touch with life itself expressing in all the ways that it's expressing in you, in us, moment by moment by moment. So the Tibetans, this is now the talk, so, you know, (laughs) or the song, or, I don't know. The Tibetans have a a very interesting phrase. They talk about the real meditation being what they call non-meditation. Non-meditation. Because as long as you think you're meditating, you're probably not. You're probably trying. And if, you know, you watch what's going on when you, you meditate, a lot of time it's commentary, you know. What? How come your mind wandered? Get it on back to the breath or whatever. You know. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like a, a football game or a basketball game. It's like the commentators are endlessly doing the storyline. And really, th- there's no story. You're just here. 
But then, of course, when the mind gets going, how many of you noticed that uh, there was something of a thought stream going on during this time? Anybody notice that, like, not... F- and that you could sometimes feel like, wait a minute, that's not what it's about. Let me get to someplace else. Who said anything was bad about thinking? See, the only thing I suggested was that you bring awareness to it, right? Not that you bring awareness to the entire dimensionality of your experience, whatever it was. So how many of you felt something in the body, you know, that you, the breath or sensations in the body and, and then in some sense put the welcome mat out for whatever it was because that was what was here, right? It is here in that moment. So there's the body, all the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And then there's interoception, proprioception. You know, there's like, can we just put out the welcome mat for experiencing living in the body? And of course, breathing. Now, one of the big mistakes that people make is that if we start out meditating with the, on the breath as the object of attention, one of the big sort of confounders is that you wind up thinking it's about the breath. It's not about the breath, it's about the knowing of the breath through this faculty called awareness, which I sometimes like to use in the present participle form, awareness seeing. Okay, because awareness is kind of a noun, and as a verb, it it kind of, in some sense, makes more sense. We're awarenessing as we go along. Hmm? And it's like another sense. In fact, the Buddhists consider it to be a sense. And without awareness, you could see without seeing. We've all done that, you know, the, the, the gorilla movie this morning, you know, I mean, there are more vivid examples of it than that. But you can actually see things, not see things that are present. You can equally see things that are not present. We human beings, like, you know, the brain is actually optical illusions and everything else were very unreliable. How many times has someone in your family that you dearly love said to you, you're not listening to me? Hmm? Or worse, you never listen to me, you know. You get more contracted. Okay? It's, it's not like you're not hearing. Why? Because you're not available. Why? Because you're lost in thought. L- underscore the lost. Okay, can we eat without tasting? You betcha. We're masters of eating without tasting. Wolfing it down, whatever, you know. Paying attention to actually chewing and tasting your food could be like one major tool in the obesity epidemic. One among many. But to actually really tune into your body in that way. But again, it's not about the tasting, it's about, not about the food, it's about the awarenessing. Do you get this? That, so that any sense you choose, the important thing is not the object that we are choosing to pay attention to, but the attending. And I love that physicians who round in the hospital are called attendings. Are there any attendings here? One or two shy ones. <laughs> uh, attending hugely powerful. When teachers, you know, what if teachers taught the kids how to pay attention instead of yelling at them to pay attention? Attending. And so that in some sense it's like the invitation is to learn how to inhabit this other human capacity that we've been gifted and that we never get, never gets any airtime. Awareness. What gets all the airtime? Thinking, 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 thinking. In school and everything else, I mean, we've become terrific thinkers. You know, you get into bed, you're still thinking. You can't stop thinking. It's like, you can't get to sleep. Hmm? So, but awareness could hold any thought. I mean, awareness always trumps thought. It's always bigger than thought. And there's nothing wrong with thought. I'm not criticizing thought at all. I mean, you know, everything depends on thought, but sometimes thought is very narrow, very kind of circular, very 
limited. Einstein, you know, said if you have one or two good thoughts in your entire life, you're, you're ahead of the curve. <laughs> so thinking, you know, to a certain extent, it's like, you know, we're, in, ter in terms of the future, we were talking about the future, we're not smart enough to forecast what's really going to happen, so we're, we're worrying. We're worrying about things that are never going to happen for the most part. And that's like driving your car with the brake on. It's stressful. It burns you up. And, but if you catch it, then it's not a problem because the awareness actually can release it, liberate it, evaporate it. Purify it, because the objects of attention are not a problem. It's the attending that, where, the, where the space is, where the well-being lies. <coughs> Excuse me, whoa. Where the eudaimonia is. It's not like, now we have to go out and get this fancy Greek-sounding word. No, you already have it. Put it better, you already are it. But if it gets obscured all the time, then, you know... Pretty soon you feel like alienated totally in the body. Like, who, where did this body come from? And, you know, who's, you know, it's like not, not a friend of mine. And, and this moment isn't so great either. You mindfulness people, all you do is talk about how great the present moment is. But this present moment sucks. You know, I don't want to be here. <laughs> well, I, I get that, but the next moment's not going to be any better if you bring that kind of attitude to it. What about experimenting with like holding it in awareness and like say when you're in a lot of pain and asking questions like is my awareness of the pain if you want to call it pain in pain? When people even hear that they go, whoa, whoa. I haven't heard that those words put together that way. Is my awareness of my fear frightened? See, it may give you, without dissociation, it's not like a clever way to dissociate, it may give you an entirely different angle on how to be in wise relationship with this moment, good, bad, or ugly. Now, that's, that's, that's a high rent in this Tower of Song. This is hard work, folks. It's, and I think, the hardest work in the world for us human beings to show up, to pay attention, to be compassionate enough with ourselves so that we can catch our own um, highly conditioned tendencies to stay locked in some kind of narrative that we tell ourselves about why it's not okay for me now. Which is just more thinking. Okay? Not necessarily bad, not necessarily even inaccurate, but may not be the whole story. It may not be complete enough. And when part of this investigation of sitting here is like the most powerful meditation practice I know of is to just ask yourself, who am I? And then listen. Don't fill it up with narrative. What am, what I, what I, or what am I? Hmm. These are very famous meditation practices. You know, but like, who am I? And then, what would the most honest answer be? Are you your name? Are you your age? Are you your CV and all your accomplishments? Are you your positive emotions? Are you your l less positive emotions? You know? Or, who's meditating? Who's breathing? I like to joke when we're teaching, you know, the leading retreats, meditation retreats, I like to joke, you know. We say that, uh, you know, I'm breathing. But let's face it, if it were up to you to be breathing, you would have died a long time ago, you know. <laughs> Talk about distraction. You know, whoops. <laughs> Dead. So the brainstem doesn't allow you, and the phrenic nerve don't allow you any, and you're conscious doesn't allow your prefrontal cortex anywhere near the brain stem and the sort of self-regulatory breathing apparatus. Like, yeah, you can hold your breath, but you can't commit suicide holding your breath. <coughs> and so it's, why should we say that it's my breath? Maybe it's like, 
if we were to just hold it in awareness <coughs> and honor the mystery of it, like, because if it was up to us to breathe, we'd be dead. If it was up to us to do the liver, we'd be dead. I mean, how, how do you know how to run, you know, thousands, a hundred thousand enzymatic reactions per second to keep the blood purified? How do you do that? So, you know, I mean, if you frame it that way, then don't get too depressed. I mean, you know, your liver's doing well. Your heart is, you know, usually doing well. Your feet actually carry you around. Your eyes work. Your ears work to some degree or other. Yeah, aging does attenuate a lot of that. But still, if you're breathing, you're ahead of the curve. <laughs> Why is this not a source of, like, eudaimonia, joyfulness? Like, you know, like, getting into, like, this moment because y you're not dead yet. And the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and whatever it is, they're just thoughts. They're just stories. And the, the trouble is they're not big enough. They're not who we are. They're who we think we are when we tell ourselves stories about who we are. And then the beauty's lost. And the eudaimonia is lost. And, the, and it's all here now. It's not like you think in 10 years you'll be more beautiful when you meditate more. No, you'll just be older. So this is like, it's no joke, folks. I mean, this is like, th this non-dual awareness is, if that gets lost and this gets turned into some kind of, uh, reduced to some kind of, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know how to say it, but in a framework where it's all conceptual, we will have eradicated a priceless opportunity to transform the planet. And this talk was like, I couldn't believe I gave the talk this title, you know, No Small Thing, the CFM Mindfulness and the Healing of the World. I mean, wow, you know, that's like, that's a big topic. And how, how arrogant can you get? Yeah, now we're going to like heal the whole world. You know, but the interesting thing is, is it's not, you know, it's no small thing what we've been doing already. And if we don't sort of exaggerate it or beat our own drums or, you know, sort of fall into sort of some kind of triumphalism as always happens when, you know, something is successful and it just like, it's killed. So what we need to do is keep paying the rent. Maybe each in-breath is paying the rent. Maybe each out-breath is paying the rent. Maybe each step. Maybe each sound. Maybe each moment where you could be present and then you catch yourself contracting and then you catch it fast enough so that you open rather than close. And maybe you do that as a kind of yoga. Open, close, open, close, in, out moment by moment, lose your mind in thought, and then an hour later you realize, I haven't even been here. I've missed three exits on the turnpike, or whatever. Or I've missed my child, or grandchild, or lover, or whatever, because like I'm lost in here. And maybe even like, hey, this place I don't even visit except on rare occasions, you know. <laughs> and the rarer the better. My friends are gone and my hair is gray. I ache in the places where I used to play and I'm crazy for love, but I'm not coming on. I'm just paying my rent every day in the Tower of Song. Leonard Cohn is a genius, but we all are. And if we disregard that, then that's a form of violence that we're doing to ourselves. If we only stay in the domain of thought, that's a form of violence and ignorance. We're ignoring something fundamental about our actual humanity that we are then 
not inhabiting and then conceptualizing and making a big deal out of meditation. So the Tibetans say non-meditation is the real meditation. And they have a couple of uh, adjectives that go along with that, which might be instrumental even to think about, although this is not about thinking, this is about experiencing it, undistracted. Okay, so one of the things that we could be mindful of is how mindless we are. In fact, that's usually the first thing that happens when you start to practice mindfulness. It's like you realize, my God, I'm almost never present. I'm almost always in some thought or other, or emotionally aroused this way or that way. Pursuing that, pushing away that, that's like inherently stressful. in the, the rest of this talk, what I'd like to do is sort of use this as a platform, undistracted. The next word is unfabricated. When I grew up I, in New York City, I don't know how this happens, and maybe it's still happening, I, I, I don't know, but there's a certain kind of age range of kids, especially boys in New York, where they get very aggressive. And they really like to sort of throw out hooks to see if they can hook the other person and get them to react to something and really lose their mind, you know? The best way to do that is insult the kid's mother. And that used to be like par for the course on the streets of New York. And then, like, we'd fight, you know? I mean, like, because you'd get enraged. And the language that was used is to say, you want to make something of it. I love that. I don't know where these 11-year-olds get this, but you want to make something of it. Unfabricated. Okay? It's like, yeah, we're continually fabricating meanings that aren't really true, associations that aren't important enough to get angry about, Taking everything personal that's not personal is just a hook to see if you f go for the bait and you go for the bait every time. Because you take it personally. You can't say anything about my mother like that. I'm going to beat the hell out of you. But they're just waiting to see you lose your mind. I don't know how these kids do it. This is like supreme Zen Dharma combat. In the streets of New York, without any training, and it's passed from generation to generation to generation. Like, you know, only between the ages of 8 and 13 do they do this. But it's like, in some sense, I don't want to exaggerate it, you know, take it more than it is, but, but there's something about it that's like, they're, you know, sort of uh, dissecting the anatomy of human relations. And the key understanding, although they wouldn't put in these words, is don't take personal things that aren't personal and you'll be okay. You'll be free. People throw negativity at you and it's not your problem. It's just a test. You don't have to take it. If you've ever seen the movie The uh, Seven Samurai, anybody ever seen that movie? The Seven Samurai, it's about five hours long or something like that, I'm saying. Uh, but there's, you know, they, they're finding these samurai and one of them, and the way they do it is like they have this test where somebody's like standing behind a door and he's going to bop them over the head and just see what they do. And, and one guy just comes and, you know, um, and he stands inside the doorway and, th and there's the, the head guy who's doing the hiring of the samurai and he, he's a samurai too. He's sitting there helping the villagers, the poor villagers out. And, and this one, he just goes and he just smiles. He just laughs and says... What's really going on? He's not going to walk in the door and get bopped on the head. He got it. Do you know what I'm saying? He just picked up the vibe. Well, you know, we all have that capacity. If we're not lost in thought, if we're distracted. Now, you start to bring mindfulness to how often during the day you distract yourself. Just yourself. You distract yourself. Then you can throw in email and all the other distractors. And pretty soon, you know, it's like, have you ever had the feeling like you're just like drowning in stuff coming at you? 
And where it's like, and uh, it's coming at you, and you have an obligation to respond to all of it, but like, who are you? You know, I mean, it's stretching the envelope, this whole technological, you know, we're uh, 24-7 connectivity. Pretty soon, I don't have it with me, but you have to pick up your iPhone and call yourself up and say, John, are you there even? Are you even there? And then, of course, it wouldn't be there. It's here. There's no there there. It's always here. So then this turns out, this is the, the last part of the talk. Uh, what about the world? The CFM is doing its job. And it is, in, in my view, without being triumphalist about it, um, it's doing it with enormous credibility. Uh, sometimes in the face of enormous obstacles, uh, which is just part of life. I mean, being part of an institution and being a group of people trying to sort of uh, move something into the world that's, you know, hard to language, never mind, you know, operationalize. And, uh, you know, it's very complicated, lots of moving parts. You've got the clinical, you've got the educational, you've got the research. I mean, this is like a major operation. And it's absolutely wonderful. And this is just the first 35 years, you know. Uh, with the right kind of leadership and the right kind of successions, and the, but most of all, the right kind of understanding. You have a center for mindfulness where nobody understands what mindfulness is, you're in trouble. Believe me, it happens. You know, reporters will come up, call up or whatever and they'll talk about it. Well, well I, I've heard about the concept of mindfulness and I'd really like you to explain it to me. And, you know, I, my impulse is to hang up the phone <laughs> because of the word concept. I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, this is like, because, but that's the place they're starting, so you have to start where you are, right? But we've got an enormous amount of work cut out for us to actually bring them from this kind of idea that everything is conceptual and, and merely conceptual, and that if you get it, then you'll get it conceptually, then you'll understand it, then it'll have all sorts of eudaimonic effects on you. It won't. This has to come from the inside, and it's larger than conceptual. It's not like there's anything wrong with the conceptual, except that if that's all there is, it will, you know, deflate every tire on the car. And the only guarding against that is you, all of us, to keep deepening the non-doing. Now, how do you do deepening of non-doing? It's paradox, okay? It's paradoxical. That's the non-dual awareness. That we're not getting caught in this or that. And we rest in an awareness that can hold this, that, and every other shade of gray between z black and white or zero and one. And catch the fleeting look on a child's face of fear or delight and not fall into thought around even that. But be in appropriate relationship to it. And there's no catechism, there's no textbook. Well, now how do I be in appropriate relationship with it? That's your genius. If you don't get caught in thought all the time, or aren't aware of how much you're caught in thought, and if you, the mind goes off, you can bring it back. You know, the mind goes off, you can bring it back. That's the instrumental thing, okay? The awareness can see the mind go off and not bring it back. It's like, oh, the mind goes off, and then it goes off here, and then it goes off there, and then it goes off someplace else. And the, the non-instrumental awareness could care less. It doesn't matter. It's like, because the awareness is what's important, not what's happening in the field of the objects of attention. That's called life. But with awareness, there's discerning and then there's kind of aligning oneself with what is deepest and best and most wholesome and most beneficial as opposed to always going for the things that are sort of lowest common denominator, sometimes the most contracted and also in some sense violent sometimes to yourself. 
or to others. And what could differentiate that? What could recognize that? Recognize that? Recognize that? Only our awareness. And as soon as you recognize it, you're free of it. Then, of course, the next moment, because it's strong habit, comes back, recognize it again. The Tibetans often say, brief moments, many times. And then, so there are many, many different ways to practice. But the most important thing is to remember that it is not about the objects of attention, it's about the attending. And then, again, to notice how much we generate narratives, especially, you know, and, and what's the f- subject, the f- the, our favorite subject of narrative? It's those, it's those sticky personal pronouns, right? Me. My success, my failure, my triumphs, my pain, my fear, my depression. I, 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 me, 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 mine, mine, mine. So if we're discerning enough, we can actually recognize when we're taking things personal, personally, creating a big story about it. The story is like, maybe even has elements of truth to it. It's just not big enough so that we fall into this and then we you know, compound the misery, compound the suffering. Just writing yourself a restraining order every once in a while around that would be a huge liberation. I'm not joking. I mean, a huge liberation. In fact, it just occurs to me, yeah, maybe meditation is really writing ourselves as restraining orders every, <laughs> every 30 nanoseconds, you know? <laughs> but with kindness, like, not don't do that, but... Don't go there, but to see what furthers eudaimonia, what furthers well-being, what furthers wholesomeness or health or you know, happiness, and what furthers more and more misery. And then we're then going to blame on somebody else because we can't ever take responsibility for generating a lot of this dukkha, this, a lot of this suffering ourselves. And again, that's another narrative. Now... Uh, this narrative stuff is actually, there are very interesting scientific studies that I'm not going to tell you about tonight that actually show that eight weeks of MBSR actually uncouples the narrative networks in the brain from other networks that are more like present moment experiential and not narrative based. It's really interesting. There's nothing wrong with the narrative. I mean, if you didn't have narrative, you wouldn't find your way home tonight you, because you wouldn't know who you are. Whoops, we just meditated with John and we really got to the nature of non, n- non-selfing and then all of a sudden like, I, I, don't, I better check my license, see where I live. <laughs> no, I hope not. This is, mindfulness is not about getting more stupid. <laughs> seriously, I mean, seriously. This stuff is way too serious to take that seriously. Seriously. So, what are the larger ramifications? I mentioned mindfulness and education. That would be a whole other talk. Uh, do you know that over 100 people in the UK Parliament have been trained in eight weeks of mindfulness course, a la MBSR? Uh, you can look it up on the web. I mean, it's just um, remarkable. The whole shadow cabinet that if this administration, uh, the conservatives lose power, they're all already to move in with mindfulness in education, in health, in you know, criminal justice, uh, military, all sorts of... They've been thinking about this. They've been training in it. It's like, come on, can you believe that? I mean, it's like... Oh, it's, just, it's just one example. I mean, there's something happening on the planet that I think is very, very powerful. Uh, you know, Saki and I were in Beijing uh, pretty much this time last year. Uh, we had 300 people attending our uh, seven-day retreat. Uh, and one of the... Inv- and and we, it was sponsored by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and many of the best medical centers in Beijing and Shanghai. And we had Dr. Liu here this summer, is that not right, as a kind of, uh, you know, um, a visiting scholar here at the Center for Mindfulness from Beijing. And, uh, you know, and at the end of the seven days, like the Chinese love to take photographs, group photographs, and they make us look like 
turkeys. They are so good at it. I mean, they, so there was this place where they, I mean, they have digital cameras that like go like that, and you know, and then they, and then they give you like a ten foot long scroll with everybody's face so clear that you could see, you know, in three hundred people, everybody looks like they are like right there, um, and the file's so big you can't email it to anybody. Uh, <laughs> So in order to go to this, have our photograph taken at the the last day, we had to walk th- five or six blocks out. Now, 300 people walking, even be getting together in in China is definitely not allowed. Definitely not allowed. You have to have permission from like the Communist Party and the police and everything to do this. And it was no problem for us. Why? Because the Communist Party was there. You know, I mean, they, you know, they, they, the, all the professors are probably part of the Communist Party, and you know, the, and they know how to make the, the the situation work. You know, so so it was like no problem. You know, the, there we have this like celebration, and they love to put banners over the posters. So this banner in Chinese and in English. Mindfulness flowers in full bloom in China. Welcome to you know, blah blah blah. John Cabot's in Saki Centurelli. I mean, just um, but stop for a moment and think. You know, I found myself saying this in China the number of times when I've been there and say, you know, I mean, you guys are interested in mindfulness and MBSR. Mindfulness is MBSR is much more Chinese than it is American. I mean, really, when you talk about this non-dual, non-doing, I mean, doesn't that sound kind of Chinese? You know, it's kind of like a Zen, you know, Chan kind of thing. It's like nowhere to go, nothing to do. In fact, that is Chan. It is straight out of the Heart Sutra, one of the greatest Mahayana Zen teachings, straight out of China. All the wisdom in China is like unreal in Chinese culture. They know nothing about it. They have to hear it from. Caucasians coming from, you know, Worcester, <laughs> who are also trained as scientists and clinicians, and you know, then it's like, oh my God, you know, 1,500 years of this non-dual, pristine, beautiful wisdom expressed in so many different ways. And you know, and the reason why you might ask, well, why am I doing that? Aside from the fact that I think. Everybody needs to practice it, you know, bar, you know, none, you know, all the different countries, because we need to wake up to not destroying ourselves and the planet, which we are really well on the way to doing. Just go check out where the glaciers are now compared to 30 years ago. It's terrifying, especially if you live in low-lying regions like 42nd Street. I'm not joking. But、uh, you know the Chinese. If you read the newspapers, you'll notice that they have a lot of problems with their minorities. I mean Tibet, because the Chinese think that Tibet is Chinese, like unreal. And also all the Muslim—I'm not even sure how to pronounce it—but the Uyghurs or whatever. I mean, there's like heavy-duty horror going on there. And I like to think: imagine if the Chinese got in touch with their own. Wisdom traditions, Dharma in particular, that ethical foundation of first do no harm, which is deeply integrated into the Chan tradition. It's called the Bodhisattva vow, and it's everything in the Buddhist teachings that have to do with ethics and morality. Like, and the reason is that if you are causing harm. You can't possibly drop into eudaimonia because your mind won't let you, unless you're an absolute, you know, sort of outlier psychopath. Your mind will not allow. You know, you'll feel something, and that's not conducive to well-being. So you're doing yourself violence as well as violence to others when you do that. Imagine if the Chinese, like, as a culture, got in touch with the possibility of organizing their society around Dharma principles, around mindfulness and heartfulness. By the way, 
just to be clear about it. In Asian languages, I'm told, the word for mind and the word for heart is the same word. So if you're hearing mindfulness and you're not, and you're not actually hearing heartfulness as you're hearing mindfulness, you're not understanding it. Again, it's conceptualizing. Okay, mindfulness. Oh yeah, I get what that is. I must be fully aware of your mind. But it's... it's. So, um, of course you know about Tim Ryan. Is Tim Ryan coming to this uh, celebration that we're having? Or? Okay. Well, anyway, you probably know that Tim Ryan wrote a book. Actually, the, just before I finish with the UK, so we have China, you know, and now that, the, are the Chinese all of a sudden going to get into mindfulness like the Chinese Communist Party? I don't think so. But we're planting seeds. Thoreau is very famous. He wrote a book called Faith in a Seed. Thoreau is famous for, for saying... Uh, Although I'm not convinced that anything will grow without a seed, show me a seed and I can imagine that it will produce wonders. Now, I've been looking at uh, morning glories uh, with my one-year-old granddaughter recently. The morning glories are like unbelievable. The way they got, and they're like Jack and the Beanstalk. You put a few morning glory seeds in and they just like, they just grow these things that keep on growing themselves. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I'm not exactly a gardener, you know, so I, I'm coming to this late in life through my one-year-old granddaughter. But all that beauty of the morning glories, the vibrancy, the, the star-like pattern, the yellow against the blue and the white, and like, which are all like, you know, just seductive ways to get the bees in there. It's like it must be really incredible for the bees if I can see it this way and I don't have compound eyes. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they all came from seeds. Like, you know, the, 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 and the cliche is the flower is in the seed. The tree is in the seed. You know, in essence or in potential. So we're all seeds of a world that uh, honors eudaimonia that honors well-being, that, you know, I mean, that honors um, what's deepest and best in us as human beings about falling, uh, rather than falling into, you know, the big three that drive everything, uh, greed, hatred, and delusion, and then creating institutions that drive greed, hatred, and delusion, like banks, for instance, who are very happy to take, you know, the world economy and destroy it if it's possible to, you know, dice up the risk and, you know, just sell people houses they can't afford and, and then, you know, derivatives and all that. That's like, you know, that's called Wall Street. Now, not everybody's doing it, but, the, but at, when it was feeding frenzy time, it was irresistible. They're doing it. We got to do it or our bank will fail. So all the banks almost brought down, you know, these economies like, you know, all over the world. Something wrong with that picture. We need legislation to modulate greed, to modulate violence, to modulate delusion, you know, or at least to try to encourage the direction of greater mindfulness and heartfulness. So, it's no small thing, what, what is being done here. Uh, and I love that it can be, the tiniest things are not tiny. The seed and the result of the seed, they're not separate. That's also non-dual. The one is in the other, in some very profound way. And so we are all, in some sense, the seeds of the healing of the world. And the more we align with the central axis of our own being, the world's already different. The world is already, in some sense, in some small but not insignificant way, healed. We've learned this in medicine over the past 35 plus years, in mind-body and behavioral medicine and everything. There's an enormous amount that we could learn that, that 
that medicine could use to like move to the medicine of the world, the healing of the world, okay? Um, the healing of the body politic. So Tim Ryan, congressman, six-term congressman from um, Ohio. Remember Ohio? It's a swing state, you know, uh, that it's like... He wrote a book called The Mindful Nation and then got reelected. I mean, that's like a really dicey thing to do. Um, and I think he's just coming out with a book on food and awareness of like, you know, food and its relationship to health and well-being. So I just want to say that those are a few of many, many different things that I could point to that suggest that the world is really in a place where it's actually starving for what is being offered here and for what is being researched here. We're dying for this. It's not just the glaciers that are dying. We're dying for it. You can be totally successful and completely miserable. Because that conventional view is too small. And I'll end with this. Like what, what mindfulness really does is it, it offers us an opportunity to kind of undergo what I sometimes call an orthogonal rotation in consciousness. That was just a fancy name that I made up when I was at MIT. And to reach people at MIT, you've got to use big words. Uh, but like where when you wake up, everything's exactly the same as before, except it's all different because you're here with the full repertoire of your humanity and you don't have to go off half-cocked because you can see your impulse to go off half-cocked and write yourself a restraining order and, and play around with it and it just becomes the yoga of flowing into our moments as if they really mattered, living our lives as if they really mattered and facing the full catastrophe of the human condition and learning how as Zorba did in this great novel, Zorba the Greek, and then the movie with Anthony Quinn, dance in the face of success and failure. That's the eudaimonia, that's health as opposed to disease or disease or stress. And it's all here now. That rotation in consciousness that can happen, that it's not like a one-time thing, you have to moment by moment by moment, in-breath by in-breath, out-breath by so I want to thank you folks for your attention. Let's take 30 seconds before uh, we close to just drop into uh, this moment in the aftermath of everything that's been said and felt and heard and however it is sitting with you whether that's one way or another way. Just allowing yourself to take up residence in your own awareness, in your own body. In your own life unfolding. And I want to say in closing that uh, when it was first proposed that I come out here and look for a job, it wasn't stress reduction. I was in the anatomy and cell biology department for three years before I started the stress reduction clinic. And somebody proposed that I work with uh, a scientist here. And, and uh, he told me that uh, I should go and check out this guy at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And I said, where's that? This was in 1976. I said, where's that? And he said, it's in Worcester. And I said, where's that? I kid you not, you know. Uh, and I have to say that in the years that I was here, uh, there's something about central Massachusetts. Every time I come back, I feel it. I mean, it is just... There's something about it that I don't, I don't even want to put into words, but it has some elements of innocence, some elements of grittiness. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but 
it is insanely beautiful. And every time I come back here, I feel it and I love it. And, and so I, I just want to thank you for your attention this evening. I want to thank you for coming. And I want to encourage you since, I, as you heard Saki say, I'm the first of a, a long line of speakers who are presumably going to be giving talks of one kind or another. Different doors into the same room, I'm guessing. Uh, the room being mindfulness or heartfulness. And the, the, the doors are uniquely amazing. So I would encourage you to come back if, if you care to uh, and to stay in touch with the CFM through the website and in every other way. Uh, and, but most important, if anything I've said tonight resonates with everything that brought you here in the first place and everything you've been through and understand already, then uh, as best you can, take that to heart and don't let it fall into memory or into a concept but to see if you can, in some sense, enliven it or let it enliven you, keeping it, uh, in some sense, in a creative oscillation with the present moment. Because that, in fact, is the core of the practice. Undistracted, unfabricated, non-meditation. It's the hardest work in the world, folks. I mean, absolutely. But on the other hand, you can be aware of how distracted you are. That's really the first step. It's not about idealizing non-distraction and not being distracted. No, we're all terminally distracted. But the awareness of it isn't at all distracted. Okay? We're constantly fabricating stories, but the awareness of it is liberating in the fabricating. Okay? And then that non-meditation, that's wisdom. That's embodied compassion. That's what I would call health. Thank you, folks. <laughs>